past, present, and future. I'm your host, Amanda Sandor, and today we're going to be interviewing Charles Van Rees. Uh, he's our advisory ecologist, so we're going to be talking to him about his current research. Uh, so, Charles, you've been on the show before, but can you tell me a little bit about your association with Livable Hawaii Kaihui? Sure. Uh, to keep it short, um, I'm a, a PhD student at Tufts University, uh, finishing my degree surprisingly and, and terrifyingly soon. Um, I've been working on Oahu now for four years, a little over four years, uh, studying the Alaiula and its ecology and movements. And so I, I became in, involved with the Hui because of their work stewarding Keawaba wetland and the Alaiula that live there. And so I've sort of become a part of that and, and been fortunate enough to, to help them with, with their efforts there and, and using you know, what knowledge I, ha I can bring in to, to sort of help them guide their conservation efforts at, at the wetland. Awesome. So you're here for another field season. How's that been going for you? It's been it's been fun and stressful, which I think is typical of, of, of field seasons in general. And so, you know, it's a very short amount of time I typically have here on the island. It's usually something like two months or a little over that. And, and there are a, a lot of things that need to be to, to get done in that time. And so in field ecology, right, you have you have one opportunity typically to gather all of your data and to collect the information you need. It all needs to, to get done at once. And then you can spend the rest of the time, you know, at the drawing board trying to design your studies, trying to analyze your data, trying to write more grants, write about what you've done and, and publicize the data. And so um, the field season becomes this this very, very concentrated time of getting a lot done. But it's um, very fun. You know, it's, it's a really nice, it's, it's a part of, uh, part of what I do that I really enjoy, that I love. And uh, so far, so good this season. It's, it's been very, very busy, and there's just been a lot of very, very early mornings getting out and chasing birds. But it's been, it's been great, and we're getting the data we need, and I'm really excited about the findings that should be coming in the next year or so. Awesome. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, so how has your work been going at Keavava specifically? Also very well. It's, it's, I really enjoy returning to the same places every year if we're talking about field seasons. And, and Keavava, uh, though I might have some bias for how much I love the place, it's, it just... It's one of my favorite places to go. It, it's really, things change there all the time. The landscape there is getting so much care and malama from the community that it's, it's always different. And it really seems to be improving all the time. And so coming back and seeing the way things are going every year is always really inspiring for me. And this year, again, we have new uh, young birds fledging and we have changes in the wetland and the landscape getting improved more, so that's wonderful. Um, we've managed to capture and band the new birds, so now we can still keep track of the whole population. We have a lot of birds that have survived and are still hanging around. We see a lot of familiar faces, like Hako and these birds that we're very fond of by now. Um, so things are going very well. And we also have some newcomers. We have some birds that, as far as we understand, it came from somewhere else and, and showed up at Keavava because the habitat is there and the habitat is good. And that's also really exciting to see. Great. And uh, so you mentioned that you had banded a couple of juveniles this year. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, are you asking sort of why why the juveniles in particular are of interest? Or, yeah. yeah. Um, well, so one big thing is that, of course, uh, we're interested in the movements of these birds around the island. And one thing we see typically with a lot of animals, uh, when they're young especially, is that the, the movement happens around a, a certain pre-adult age, and it's called juvenile dispersal. And that's one thing we're really focused on. So this, uh, this idea that... Um, you know, sort of teenagers or, or young birds or animals are trying to get out from their home and go someplace new and get away from their, from their parents to go and find their own breeding opportunities and live their own lives somewhere. Um, and so whenever we have these, these juveniles at, at, at Keavava, we typically see that they, that they seem to go someplace else. We ban them and then they, they disappear. And, and obviously, perhaps, you know, some of those are, are mortality events, but, but we have seen birds showing up in other places. And so we know that they're leaving and, and, and spreading across Oahu. And so um, when we have juveniles at the wetland, we are always really excited to put these bands on them because then we can keep track of them over time. And we can, we can see where they're going to turn up and understand where birds from Keavava and birds from other wetlands go during that period of juvenile dispersal, which is really interesting. Awesome. And so why is that important when birds move from one area to another? Why is that important to you? Mm. So for a lot of species, it might not be of particular uh, for example, conservation relevance. But a big thing we're concerned about on Oahu is, is the loss of the natural wetlands. So um, a lot of these, these areas are, these, these wetland habitats are in places that are very prone to development because they have really good fresh water sources, they're very level ground, a lot of times it's very nice soil and has a very, it's a good view of the ocean. It's usually just in these, these very, these prime places for development, and so they, they almost always are getting converted to, to you know cities and, and hotels and what have you, and that's resulted in a really substantial loss of, of this habitat over time, and this is of course the habitat that this bird needs to live, 
And so with, with this reduction in habitat, you don't just have less, you also have smaller pieces that are isolated from each other. And that's really what we're concerned about, is that maybe 500 years ago, an Alaula at Keavava could you know, travel across the landscape through the kalo fields, through the rice fields, whatever was there, through, through the natural wetlands to get to the other side of the island. And that would keep the population very steady. It would keep the population, um, the gene pool very healthy, and it would allow this sort of buffering effect to keep the, keep the numbers uh, sort of more stable. And what we have now with these smaller patches of habitat around the island is that these populations are not able to necessarily support each other, or at least we're not sure if they are. And so we need, to, we need to see whether these birds are moving between these populations in order to see whether we're going to have this, these sort of buffering effects. And if we don't have them, of course, then that, that's of conservation concern because then we start to worry about the oscillations in these populations because they can't help each other. So we are really interested in this juvenile dispersal and the movement of these birds because that can help us understand how best to manage them on the landscape. Does this mean that they are all one big integrated unit or are they smaller individual pieces which we have to worry about and, and, and care for on an individualized basis? Which can, you know, depending on how you're, you're spending your money, it's, it's, you need to uh, be very wise about the way you're, you're approaching these things strategically. And that's our, our big interest. Okay. And uh, I believe you have some pictures about uh, the habitat in Hawaii wetlands um, and kind of how they've developed. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about those? Sure, specifically the wetland ecosystems? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we have one picture. So this, this for example, is um, an image showing us a simulation that, that um, I designed with my advisor a few years ago, which is estimating the extent of wetland habitats on the island of Oahu prior to Polynesian arrival. So this is, this is what the island would have been doing without any people there whatsoever. And so you can see it's pretty substantial coverage. Versus the second picture, which is showing what we have now. And you can see a very substantial loss in this wetland habitat. And you're going from this much more large integrated network of habitats to something much smaller with sort of isolated fragments of habitat. And that's, that's what we start to become concerned about is that, well then, what's going to happen to the birds that are living in these areas that are now going from being in some larger network to being in small islands that don't interact with each other at all. Mm. Okay. And, uh, so what does the data that you've collected over the last four years about the movement of the birds, what does that tell you? So a lot of these things are still, are still kind of coming in. Um, the things that we do have information on now come from uh, a, a study in the field of population genetics, which is essentially that we were taking gene samples from birds at all these different isolated habitat islands and comparing the gene pools. And basically, if we see similar gene pools, that means that those populations are interacting in some way. Either the individuals are moving between them or they're, or they're breeding with each other. And so we're getting similar genes exchanged uh, versus ones where the gene pools are very different. That implies to us that those populations are they're really islands. I mean, they're, they're isolated in some capacity. And that's what worries us. And so we've been, we've been um, trying to map out these individual habitats. And we should have a picture with a bunch of pie charts on it that, that basically illustrates um, the differences in gene pools between the different populations and how they're all made up from one another. There it is. And, and one of the interesting things we've found is that there are some sort of assemblages of habitats. For example, if you look down at uh, Kaneohe Kailua, a lot of those habitats, um, the populations, we see a lot of the same pattern, with this blue being the, the biggest uh, ge gene frequency, followed by yellow and purple and green. Um, a lot of those populations seem to be very well connected, which is excellent. We're really happy to see that. But then if you look, for example, at, at Keavava, we see these populations, a uh, population that seems very genetically distinct, which, which tells us a couple things. Um, and generally what we've been taking from it is not only, okay, hey, this is a population that maybe because of where it is on the Wahoo's landscape, it's very isolated, um, but also, that it, it might also be a place where we have, uh, it might have been a, a genetic uh, refugium. So it might have been some place where these birds, when they almost went extinct earlier this century, a place where they were able to hang, out, hang on and stay, and then since then have been repopulating a lot of the rest of the island from there. And so it shows in some ways um, sort of the major ecological importance of Keavava in Oahu's past. And of course, knowing that gives us a lot more information about how to manage Keavava into Oahu's future and giving us some idea of its, of its real value and uniqueness, which I think is really exciting because you wouldn't have that information just by looking at the birds or looking at how they're moving. You need to look into the past using their genetics. That's, that's the power of that tool. But wow, that is really, really interesting. <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> and so when you're looking at the birds and you're banding them and you're looking at their genetics, are you also looking at the habitats that they live in? Yes, and, and, and I'm glad you asked that question, actually. So that, that's another major part of the research we're trying to do um, uh, this year. And we, and we started this project a couple years ago, but now it's really picking up momentum. And this is us trying to get a, a basic feeling for what these birds like. 
Um, and so besides just seeing their movements, looking at the places they stay, the places they breed, and trying to quantify and measure what about these places is so attractive to them. And of course, the, the goal of that, and, and the reason we worry about that at all, because it seems sort of obvious at first, is if we can really get an idea of what aspects of a habitat attract these birds, make them do better, make them breed better, or make them come in from other places, then when we're managing our lands, we can use those techniques. Right? And if we want there to be more alaiula on the island, all we have to do is X, Y, and Z, things that we found they like, and then all of a sudden they're going to be doing better, they're going to be breeding better, having better success, and so on. And of course, this is you know, a major thing that we're interested in for Keavava is, is you know, we, we want to steward that landscape. And part, one of our major conservation goals is to support the alaiula. So with, it's possible that with some very small, you know, low-intensity management strategies, we could really increase the number of birds there and increase its its conservation value on the island in general, which would be great. Yeah, that would be really, really great to see. Um, so out of the, um, the study that you've been doing on the habitats, what are some of the things you've seen that make a habitat attractive to Alayula? The jury is still kind of out on that one. The, the, the main thing we're seeing so far, we're seeing a very big association with uh, I.I. or Bacopa monieri, which is a, a native sort of ground cover that grows in very moist soil. It kind of likes wet feet. It can also grow as a floating mat. And the, the birds really seem to like foraging on that. And so I suspect having that is a, is a, a nice one. Um, the biggest thing we've been seeing is we don't really have a very good word for it yet. We've been calling it interspersion. And I, th I, would, I would call it just sort of like the messiness of the habitat. The more patchy it is within a single wetland, it seems to be the better. So rather than having one half be all of the emergent vegetation, like the big tall reeds, and one half being you know just broad open water, if we have patches of reeds and patches of open water and patches of bacopa or I, I, then we typically see a lot more birds. And so the more of that mixing we have seems to make a big difference for them. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to do with the conservation plan for Keavava is start to to uh, change it from being sort of sectioned off, here's open water, here's the bulrush, but, but actually trying to mix those two together and make these smaller patches. Um, the mechanism for that we're still trying to figure out, I actually suspect part of it is because these birds are so pugnacious, is they really like to fight. They love fighting each other. It's really funny. Um, and so when you have this patchiness, they can't see each other from so far away. They have a shorter line of sight, and so they're more likely to make territories, and they, they don't see their neighbors, so it's like, okay, it's fine, I'm, I'm okay here. Whereas if, they, if there was a big open space, they'd probably get back to fighting and then they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to settle there. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I understand you have uh, kind of a pilot project at Keavava with uh, this wetland enhancement um, in a certain area. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. We've, we've, we've um, talked about it a couple times in the past. So I'll, I'll, I'll be quick, but this was sort of just one of the coolest, most surprising, surprising things that, that we kind of ran across, especially in my first couple years working with the Little Haikai Hui was... Um, I, I remember speaking to Elizabeth and some other folks who were working on the wetland about the fact that, hey, you know, over on the Havea side, we have a lot of bulrush, but there's open water underneath it. And if we cleared some of that and maybe planted some eye, it would be a great place to just have another family of Aliula. And it, who knows, maybe it would work. And, and I didn't hear anything from, from uh, the Hui for a while. And then when I came back the next year, they had done this exactly, you know, what I had recommended without me knowing it. And birds had showed up and they had another breeding pair all of a sudden, and they're still there. Which is just amazing. So they just doubled the number of breeding birds at the wetland just like that, you know, which is yeah. just so cool. I mean, that's just, that's real science happening in real life, and it's fascinating to see it. Yeah. Really inspiring stuff. So um, hopefully, you know, w with that success behind us, we can really continue that effort and, and see the types of changes we're hoping to. That's really cool to hear about, yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, the birds moving around. Can you tell me, do you have a theory about how they might be moving? the way they're getting from place to place. Mm -hmm. This is, this is the, the biggest and hardest question I'm trying to approach in my PhD. And, and we're trying to answer it a number of different ways. And sort of just like, just like the other movement-related information, the jury's still out on the really, really big stuff. But we're starting to get some interesting signs now, which get me very excited. Um, so again, using the genetic data, which are the ones that we have right now, we're waiting on a lot of this other stuff because it takes a lot longer to come in. Um, using the genetics, uh, I, I was using a... a a theoretical framework called landscape genetics, which sounds very strange. The, the essential idea behind it is, is looking at those same patterns that we observed in the gene pools of the populations and trying to see whether aspects of the landscape were affecting those, those gene pools. And so I have a, a few pictures there as well. Um, there's one with uh, four pictures of Oahu. There we go. So this, this is um, 
this is essentially what we're doing is we're constructing maps of how we imagine Alaula might be seeing the landscape. And so if you look at one of these maps, it's, it's what's, called, what's called a resistance surface. It's a resistance map. So basically, the different colors represent how hard it would be for an Alaula to move through that that part of the landscape. So everything black is something that might be very easy for them to move through, and everything lighter or whiter is going to be difficult for them to move through. So those are different ways of looking at it. So the one in the upper left would be, OK, maybe the Alaula move through rivers. Or the right one might be, maybe they can only move through low elevation areas, and mountains are very hard to pass through. Uh, versus the one on the bottom is a, sort of a hydrological model. Maybe they can only move through wet areas, and dry areas scare them off. And the left one is about sort of, maybe they don't like forests, but they like open areas, things like that. Uh, and so we've, we've been comparing all these using this genetic data, and what we've been seeing, there's another picture to show very specifically what we've been seeing. This type of map is the best one. So on the left side, we have a satellite image of uh, Kailua with, in pink, highlighted all of these um, wetlands features and canals and drainage areas. Um, and on the right, you can see what we treated the landscape, which basically we were, we were saying, okay, do these birds like to use uh, canals and rivers as corridors? And this was by far the best supported idea for how they might be moving. It really, really explained the patterns we were seeing way, way, way better than anything else we could come up with. So this gives us a very strong idea that these birds might be using things like streams and drainage canals. I have also a picture of, um, of a uh, sort of a roadside uh, swale right there. This, this is uh, taken off of Haleiwa Beach Road. Um, this is an area where people every year, every winter, are reporting to me that they see Alaula. And then we always go and we don't see them. And so it's an interesting point, right? The idea is that a place like this is not some place that the Alaula would breed. It's not protected. The habitat's not particularly nice for them. But they're always seen there. Why? I think it's because they're moving through and not necessarily breeding there. And, and for what we talked about with the conservation impacts, right? Uh, things like this, and there's also another picture of a, of a stream. Um, those types of areas, which we, don't, we wouldn't expect to see Alaula breeding there, and we wouldn't be able to manage them like that, they're still really important for the species, is what we're finding out, right? If these things are allowing them to move better, if these are like their highways through which they move to get from habitat to habitat, that means if we decide to make more of these or if we decide to take care of these in some way, we can be benefiting the species without necessarily having to create more habitat, right? It's going to be very hard for us to say, oh, mm, let's go tear down that giant multi-million dollar building and construct a new wetland. It's not going to happen. But what if we said, oh, what if, you know, if we want to manage our floodwaters on the side of this road, rather than having a cement line ditch, we have a grass line ditch that fills up with water and just sits there for a little while. That's the sort of thing that Alaula could use to be moving around. It would benefit them. It would reduce their extinction risk. But it wouldn't involve the same commitment as trying to take care of a wetland. As you guys you know, know very well, managing a wetland, stewarding something like Keababa is a lot of work, even a small one. Um, and so this is, a, this is a way that we might be able to, to help these birds without necessarily having to go through the, you know, the, the really intense effort of, of creating new habitat. Instead, we can link their habitats better with these sorts of things. And that, that's, that's the most exciting thing to come out of it so far for me. Yeah, that's really cool to hear about all of that. Um, so with this information, uh, how do you plan to, what do you plan to do with it? Do you want to have land managers or wetland managers uh, kind of use this information or just where are you looking to go with it? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, like you said, that, that's the dream for me is having people use this, this information. I, I love the science. I love studying these birds. I love learning about what they do. But for me, personally and professionally, it's got to be used. It's got to do something. I, I want to contribute something to the conservation on Oahu. And so my hope is that, the, is that these data, once we're able to publish them and get them out in the world, that, we, that people will use them. And we're, we're hoping to find ways to communicate with landowners, to communicate um, with local governments about how they manage their water, how they manage their land, to find ways that they can also benefit these birds, right? So, so one major really nice win-win is this whole business of the drainage canals and the rivers. It's, very, it's, it's oftentimes very cheap and easy to, to build something like that, to just dig a hole or a ditch on the side of the road and use that instead of big cement line gutters. The whole idea of green infrastructure is becoming a very big deal nowadays in, in sort of new urban approaches to water management. It's very possible that that sort of approach would be really, really great for Honolulu or other parts of Oahu, where we have a lot of problems now with too much impervious surface, with contamination of the seawater and things like that having this green infrastructure could really reduce a lot of these problems with pollution going to the reefs and sedimentation and things like that while simultaneously helping out this bird a little bit. And I think those sorts of win-win situations 
as I see it, are the key to effective conservation. So my hope is maybe that with this information, we can seek out some more of these win-win situations and really create some change to, to, to benefit these birds and ourselves at the same time. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so do you think that any of that information or um, the wetland management ideas that you have, do you think any of that will affect Kiavava or wetlands like that? Um, where do you, how do you think that they would affect them? Mm -hmm. So, the, the, I mean, the, the movement-related stuff, certainly if, if people decided to start implementing water management in that way that would also benefit these birds, then I think what we'd be seeing is um, much lower fluctuations in the number of birds between wetlands because we'd have a lot more of this movement going on. And we'd probably have newcomers much more often at Keavava. You know, I think, I, I suspect that every year we'd have a, a couple more birds showing up from who knows where. Maybe finally we'd have some banded birds showing up. It's always frustrating to me to have unbanded ones come in because I'm like, ah, where'd you guys come from? I thought I had everybody. Um, and so we'd be seeing more of that movement. Um, fr from the habitat quality perspective, I think what we'd be seeing are the habitats that are out there right now, the people who are taking care of them could take some simple steps and then increase the number of birds on their properties. Um, and I know that, that for some people that's not a, that's not a huge priority, but for, for groups that where that is a major part of their, of their motivations, they'll, they'd have the power and the freedom to do that, which is something that right now we don't necessarily know how to do best for these birds. And so having a quantitative uh, form of advice to give them, hey, you know, if you do these things, they will come or they will breed better, that's powerful. And it would be really nice to give people that sort of practical guide. Great, yeah. Um, so that kind of sounds like the wetland enhancement plan that you had talked about. And we have a couple minutes left. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that and um, kind of the plan that you had set out for Kayababa. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that all came about more or less as, as, as part of our, our larger sort of Alai Ula research project, conservation project, um, sort of push that came about this past year with the, the grant we received from the Disney Conservation Fund, which was just a major, major boon to our efforts here and has allowed us to, to, think, to think big, to think so much more on a grander scale of, of how we're going to approach these issues. Um, so part of that was just saying, okay, well, with the resources that we have now and with the, the research that's coming in with how to manage for these birds, what can we do at Keavaba to really improve? habitat. And there are a number of sort of things in, in consideration right now. And I think it's, it's just going to depend on sort of the logistics now or what, what rolls out and what we end up really doing. We know that, uh, that if we clear out more and more of this bulrush and increase interspersion, we're going to see a lot more birds. And I suspect that's going to be one of our primary goals is to, is to do that. Among other things, you know, continuing to trap for mongoose, finding ways to, to keep track of other invasive predators that might, that might cause problems. Um, there's, there's talk of, okay, whether or not we need to build some sort of a predator-proof predator fence to keep things from getting in. I mean, it's, a, you know, Keavava is, is wonderful because it's in an urban area where people can come and, 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 you know, Kupuna and Keiki and all sorts of people can come and see these birds and experience Alaula, experience a native Hawaiian species, which is becoming harder and harder to do without going up, way up Mauka. That's phenomenal. But there are shortcomings to its location, right? If you're in the middle of a city, there are cats, <laughs> and there are all sorts of things coming from the city that can cause a lot of problems for the birds. And it's you know it's not to lay the blame on anybody, but regardless of you know where it's coming from, these things are the city is providing these pressures that we need to manage. And so the the enhancement plan also has to do with you know how can we how can we deal with those specifically? Okay. Um, I, I would say those are those are sort of our main focuses at this point. And then um, as we move forward, you know, and we start to make major progress, then we'll be thinking, okay, what's the next step? But those are, I would say, in terms of triage, those are like, those are the first like screaming issues we're trying to get to. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you had mentioned the grant from Disney Conservation Fund. Um, so I'm interested to hear about how possibly, um, how you went about getting that grant and, you know, how much getting grants is really a big part of your PhD, it sounds like. Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's more for me than it has been for, for some other people, just because uh, I decided to be working on issues in the Hawaiian Islands while doing my PhD in Boston. And this is always what people are like looking at me like I'm crazy for, right? Is I had to, I had to be able to raise the money to do that research myself, to get out here and to, and to do the work. Um, and so, so a major part of my work, yeah, ended up being finding uh, grants and other sources of funding to, to get out here and, and then writing proposals and trying to come up with innovative research and trying to come up with convincing arguments and, and conservation impacts that I could sell in order to, to get out here and, and, and do the work and really convince people, hey, you know, I think this is important and here's why. 
Um, the Disney Fund came about um, essentially through there, there's a there's another group that I that I work with at Tufts called the Tufts Institute of Environment, and they've they've funded a bunch of my work in the past. And they, they, they actually forwarded that grant to me and say, hey, you know, is this, is this something of interest to you? This looks like your kind of stuff. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is perfect, right? The, because the Disney Conservation Fund was looking for this combination of they wanted real research, they wanted actual on-the-ground conservation, and they wanted outreach and communication. And I thought, oh, my God, this is perfect. This is the sort of thing that, that we can really – that we can really do with a collaboration with a group like Livable Hawaii Kaihui, where we have, you know, my my sort of team could come in and, and offer the research benefit and the management, and then Livable Hawaii Kaihui has all these volunteers and people who can who can really do the on the ground stuff and like the nitty gritty and getting the work done, and then we have you know all these resources and connections to to go places and reach out to the community and not only get them involved directly in the work but help them really appreciate what it is they're doing. And help them understand that you know the value of things like wetland ecosystems in Hawaii and native bird species in Hawaii, which people oftentimes don't recognize them the way they should. And it's it's a really special thing, right? And on these islands, we have things that nobody else has, and this is one of those things that's so important to appreciate. And so, for me, it, it it's just been a phenomenal experience to feel like the work that I'm doing can get applied so much more broadly, right? Between having these wonderful outreach events, like when you're painting people's faces and, and, and making all like ula dolls and things like that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to approach conservation, I think. It's, it's very integrative, which I enjoy a lot. Great, yeah, it has been really fun uh, working with you with the Disney Grant and doing all of our outreach events. Um, I'm really glad that you've been enjoying it as well. <laughs> it's yeah. <been> a blast. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, well, I, I do wanna say, uh, We'll have some events coming up throughout the year for um, the Disney Conservation Fund. Um, we'll be culminating our fund with um, a World Wetlands Day event in February 2018. Uh, so I do want to say that, and we'll have some flyers going out and some emails going out uh, with other information about events coming up. Um, so I just want to thank you for being here today. Thanks and, for having me. Yeah, and thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of Past, Present, Mauna Lua, Past, Present, and Future. So thank you. Mahalo. Thank you.